What a beautiful day we have to assemble. We're thankful for God's blessing of the rain, some of the coolness that uh, is here today but may not continue through the week. But we're especially glad that we have chosen to assemble as we've been commanded this day, that we might worship and give thanks and glory to God. And we thank you for being here as our members. We know we have several visitors this morning. I've seen some come in and uh, if you have not had the opportunity to be greeted by one of us, please stay and let us do that. And we can make you personally feel welcome and thank you for being here. If you are attending with us virtually, we also uh, hope that things are well with you and that at some point you will be well enough and uh, you will choose to come back and worship with us each day, uh, Sunday. <clears throat> we will follow this service today with a Bible study period. We will assemble again this evening at 6 o'clock for our evening worship, and we assemble on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock for a Bible study period followed by a devotional period. This evening will be the last of our summer series. Brother Kyle Butt will be uh, doing this, uh, the lesson for that, but we are especially uh, glad to be able to say that our young men will conduct the other part of the service this evening. So. Let's return and support them uh, as they grow in God's service. Our scripture this morning will be taken from Romans chapter 7, verse 7, if you'd like to turn there as we continue the announcements. Romans chapter 7. If you did not receive a communion cup, if you would please just hold your hand up, one of our ushers will be glad to bring you one at this time. There will be an evangelism seminar at the New Union Congregation, August 7th through the 9th. There are meetings at the following congregations, August 7th through the 10th. That is Bonner, Noah, and Unity. There will also <clears throat> be a gospel meeting, August 7th through the 12th, at the Auburn Congregation uh, in Woodbury. Elders and deacons, you're reminded you will meet at 5 o'clock this evening for your uh, uh, meeting. And the general medicines meeting of the men, <clears throat> excuse me, the men of the congregation will be this evening following the evening service. Our youth reminded of the youth project that will be on August the 2nd. Uh, you need to be here at the building at 10 o'clock. If you need other details about that, please see Jason. The VBS reward trip, uh, 8-6, uh, please be here at the building at 530 for that. This morning we would like to extend our sympathy to the family of Wilmus Bolden. <clears throat> His Valley. If you could stand, we'll have an opening prayer and remain standing for our first hymn. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day of life. We thank you for the blessings that you provide for us each day through your providence and your love and the plans that you have established from the beginning of time. But above all, Father, we're thankful that you set aside a day that we as Christians can come together and learn more about you to give you praise and glory and exhortation. Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, that those things we do this day would be acceptable in thy sight. For this prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name, and amen. I will travel through life with trouble and strife. I'm a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. My toil will be o'er and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of Father in heaven, we come to you this morning in prayer, first of all, recognizing your greatness, your glory, the fact that you are so far above us as the heavens are above the earth, and we thank you, Father, for, for being our loving and kind Heavenly Father. We thank you for all of the blessings that you give to us as your people. We thank you for our food, clothing, shelter. We thank you 
for all the spiritual blessings that we enjoy as Christians. We thank you that you sent your son to die for us, to walk among us with a perfect example for us to look to. We thank you for the blood that he shed that affords us the forgiveness of sins. Father, we know that as your children, we still sin from time to time. We do things we shouldn't be doing. We fail to do those things that we should. Father, we pray that you'll help us to truly repent of these things, and we thank you that we have the promise of forgiveness if we do. Father, we ask your blessing upon those who are sick this morning and those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We pray, pray your richest blessings upon them. That they will be comforted and strengthened, and uh, if they are suffering physical uh, illnesses, that uh, if it's in your will that you will help them to overcome these things. And Father, please help us to be aware of them and that we also have an obligation to do what we can to help those who are in difficult circumstances. Father, we pray that you'll be with us in our service this morning, that we will all enter into the service with our whole hearts, that you will be glorified and that we will be blessed. These things we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. So on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. We as Christians are blessed. We have many things that a lot of, uh, many other people don't have. And one of those blessings is uh, to make money, and we hope that we can give back today without grudging, without uh, uh, holding back, but of a cheerful giver. If you will, bow your heads as we pray at this time.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this first day of the week that we could come together as Christians to worship you, to sing praises to your name. But we know that we're blessed and we today want to give back a portion of that, what we've made with a cheerful heart, hoping that those monies will spread the kingdom of you and the kingdom of God so that others can be saved. There's many things that it's needed for in this world so that we can spread your name and we hope that those monies are used good. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, as the Lord's invitation is extended to us, we're going to sing, There is a Fountain. It's number 662 in the hymn books. And now as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey It's here to open the bread. And if you will turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. <clears throat> There's many prophecies that, uh, that we know about in the Old Testament, and uh, some of them are prophesying about uh, the coming Savior. And the Psalm 22 portrays, if you will, the, uh, the things that he was going to, and it, it makes it real to me when you read about this, of the pain, of the anguish, of the fear, the things that we as humans uh, deal with sometimes, but not to the point that Christ did. As we're just saying, love so divine, so amazing. Uh, as we read this, imagine uh, our Christ and where he is. I'm going to start with just verse 12. Uh, chapter 22, verse 12. It says, Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart, it's like wax. It's melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. And you've brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They, they pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. And they divide my garments among them. And 
for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Christ knew that he was doing good for us. Uh, the love that he had as he hung there on the cross and amongst all the bulls and the dogs that was there to sacrifice him, he knew that it was for us. As we partake of this bread, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus and our Savior did for us as he hung on the cross to sacrifice his life to save us from our sins. We know there was no other way. We know that he had to be the perfect sacrifice, and as we partake of this bread, we're reminded of his body, his body that hung on the cross to sacrifice for us. As, as we partake of this bread, may our minds go back to that cross and watch as he suffered for us. In Christ's name, amen. We also know that the blood shed from the cross was needed for us to be saved. That perfect blood uh, was needed to cleanse us from our sins. As we read in the scripture and the pain that he went through uh, was because of all of our sins was on his back. All of our sins was, was laid on him so that he could sacrifice that perfect sacrifice. So as we partake of this fruit of the vine, may we be reminded of his blood. So if you bow your heads, please. Father in heaven, we thank you again so much for the, the avenue of coming to you in prayer. And at this time, we are reminded of Christ's blood that was shed on that cross. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, we're reminded of that blood and that sacrifice that saves us from all of our sin and the love that he had for us to do that. Uh, please, I hope we take this in a worthy manner. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There is no greater point in life than whether or not you will be a Christian. There's no greater goal in life than where you will spend eternity. The book of Romans was written by the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul to try to encourage and exhort those people who lived in Rome to be able to hear the gospel and be obedient to it. In Romans 1 and verse 16, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it is contained the righteousness of God from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. In that gospel is contained the righteousness of God. When we studied Romans 7 last week, we observed that it was not according to that Old Testament law that man would be saved. That law was incapable of doing what man needed to be done. 
Paul opens Romans chapter 8 with these words. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What a powerful thought in mind. No condemnation to those who are in Christ. And then he talks about walking by the Spirit. That's where I want to begin our lesson this morning. Does the Holy Spirit live in you? I know that's a point that you have to think about. The truth is it is somewhat controversial because the denominational world believes that the Holy Spirit somehow lives embodied within you and that that Holy Spirit guides you daily, nudging you in a direction or another direction, affirming whether or not you are doing the right thing and the words that are most often used by them are is that the Holy Spirit is empowering you to become a Christian. There is within that idea that the Holy Spirit is somehow in control of who I am and what I think. That's basically the doctrine of Calvinism that suggests that I don't have the ability and you don't have the ability to do what's right. It's only because God somehow overrules us to be able to do those things. Now let me tell you, Romans chapter 8 is not nearly as sensational as that. You know, a lot of people today, when it comes to the topic of or the thought of the Holy Spirit, they want it to be something that's sensational, something that is just better felt than told. Now Romans 8 is going to instruct us, to educate us, to help us to understand what this really means. And so this morning, I would like for you to take your Bibles. Please open them to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to talk about, does the Holy Spirit live in you in these first 17 verses? We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at some definitions. The terms flesh and spirit are not only found in chapter 7, they're found in chapter 8. Then we're going to look at direction. Who's leading you? Who are you following? And then finally, a declaration whose side you're on. When you go to Romans 7 and 8, there is a contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We observed last week that Paul taught that the Old Testament does not, cannot save you. And in chapter 8, he will say it is the law of Christ that does save us. But there's also that contrast between the flesh and the spirit. What do you mean when you say the flesh and the spirit? Well, let's let the text tell us. You know, so many times when people start talking, they'll say, well, let me tell you what it means. Well, Let's let Scripture tell us what it means. If you go back to chapter 7, I just want to pick out three verses and notice them, and then we're going to dovetail them into chapter 8. Paul would write in Romans 7 and verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit unto death. Notice, when we were in the flesh. But these Romans, and including Paul, were still alive. And so when you read the words in the flesh, that doesn't mean that Paul has died. Look at verse 18. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, or in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Notice Paul this time is saying... In me, that is in my flesh. Now, there is a dichotomy. There is a two parts here. There is what is a fleshly desire, and there's another desire. Go down with me to verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with my mind I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh the law of sin. 
notice the mind is involved and there are influences in our life that are of a fleshly nature. But now let's go to chapter 8. That's where Paul begins to open up the idea. In verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk, you know, daily walk, the way you live, according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Do you understand the difference now, the setting of your mind? What kind of things you think about? What kind of things that are motivating you? Now, most of us have some things that motivate us, that press us, push us. Well, let's see what it is. Verses 8 and 9. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Now, focus for just a moment on what he just said. In the flesh. Now, Paul was in the flesh. He was physically living. The Romans were physically living at that time and when he wrote this. But he said those in the flesh cannot please God. Paul is not saying that as long as you're in a fleshly body, you can't please God. But he's talking about a mindset. Look at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There is, again, that drawing of the strong distinction between the two. But now keep going. And you notice the difference here. The flesh represents the worldly, physical desires. And we're going to see that even clearer in just a moment. Whereas the Spirit, the mind is directed by the Spirit. And there's a figure of speech called metonymy. And I'm not here to give an English lesson or a grammar lesson, but that figure of speech is where you let something represent a whole category. For instance, you may have heard that the White House position on this topic is this. The White House is a building. It's where our president lives. That's a metonymy, where you let something that is of a specific nature represent so you can understand it. And I would suggest to you that the flesh is representative of the way a physically-minded person thinks. The spirit is representative of the way God wants us to think as he's revealed himself through his word. Now, if that wasn't enough, let me just take you to some other passages in the New Testament that will help us to understand this. In Matthew 26, in verse 41, Jesus spoke to Peter, James, and John, and he told them to watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Spirit is willing. Their minds of the spiritual thought wanted to do what God wanted them to do, but there was a physical desire to sleep because they had not slept. Many of us understand that tension that exists between the flesh and the Spirit. In John 6, Jesus gave a great lesson on the bread of life. He had fed them with physical bread, and they had enjoyed it. And then he followed it up with a lesson on spiritual bread, of which he says, I am the bread of life. And what he tells them in verse 63 is, it is the spirit that gives life. The fresh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Or let me take you to the book of Galatians. This is just such a powerful passage here in Galatians 5. In fact, we could take Romans 8 and put it right in parallel with Galatians 5, and you'd say, boy, those are amazing chapters side by side. 
But in Galatians 5, verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. There's a tension there between the two of them. Either you're on the one side, the fleshly mind, or you're on the other side, the spiritual mind, and those just really don't get along. They're so contrary to one another. But if you really want to understand it, you drop down to verse 19 through verse 23, and Paul will explain how the two are so divergent from one another. He said, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Those are all in the category of fleshly things. But on the other side, the spirit, Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You see, Paul is trying to get us to see the two different sides of flesh versus spirit. And then you get to chapter 6, and he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. He's trying to tell us those are two different directions in life, which that means flesh and spirit are used for that which guides man's decisions. When you got up this morning and you made your plans to come to worship this morning, it was the spiritual side of you that made that choice. If you decided last night you were going to go out and party on the town and you involved yourself in sinful behavior, it was the fleshly side of you that caused you to do that. That leads me into the second part of this, and that is direction. Who is leading you? Now, we can find that frequently in the Bible. I will tell you that, you know, sometimes we'll say a person is a Judas to mean that he is a betrayer. He may be a person motivated by money and he would betray someone else for money. Or someone else may say, the devil made me do it. No, it wasn't the devil. It was what you believe the devil telling you because you listen to him, he's guiding you. One of the best illustrations I can find of this is found in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 23. If you'll remember, right after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, and right after the Lord told him that upon that rock he would build his church, and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. From that point, Jesus showed the disciples that he was going to have to go to Jerusalem he was going to have to suffer many things at the hand of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed the third day. Peter's response to that is, not so, Lord. Look at verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. He calls him Satan. Peter's not Satan. Peter was standing in the place of and uttering the words that Satan wanted said. Now, Peter wasn't Satan. But I will tell you also that Jesus said to him, you're not mindful of the things of God. You're not letting God guide your thoughts, Peter. You're letting the devil guide your thoughts. You're mindful of the things of men. That's the contrast of who is leading you, who is guiding you, who is directing you. Does the Holy Spirit dwell within the Christian? Well, yes, he does. But how does the Holy Spirit dwell within the Christian? The same way that the Son and the same way that the Father does. Look at the context here. Pick up with me at verse 9 in Romans chapter 8. 
He said, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Don't stop there. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Well, look at verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised Jesus from the dead? God the Father. So in this one passage, you have the spirit, you have the Christ, and you have the Father, and they're all three are said to dwell within us. Why do we somehow want to take this passage and say that the Holy Spirit indwells me in some uh, personal, direct way, guiding me, forcing me, nudging me, and do not say the same about Jesus and say the same about the Father. They're all three in those two verses there. Christians are, though, led by the Spirit. In Romans 8 and verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Just like Galatians 5, 18. But you, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we can be dwell, or we can have the Spirit of God the Father, the Spirit of Jesus the Son, the Spirit of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, guiding and directing us and leading us, but not in some miraculous way. So that means... The question then rises, how does the Spirit lead us? If the Spirit is not somehow nudging me, not somehow prompting me and, and empowering me from within, that leads me to the question, does he do it directly or through a medium? If the Spirit does it directly, that means that he would say to me, Tony, you know what, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And I do that. Because he tells me that. On the other hand, if he does it through a medium, that means his word comes through some medium, something between us. I'd suggest to you that's the scriptures, and we're going to try to prove it from what the scriptures say. Because if it were direct, and God told me what to do, and he didn't tell you what to do, that means God would be showing some partiality respect to persons. There are so many people in this world that are somehow fearful. I don't feel something inside of me that's prompting me. And I, Well, am I really a Christian? Because I don't know if the Spirit's dwelling in me or not. The medium is God's Word. It was that which was given by the Holy Spirit. Let me take you through some passages that will prove that point. In 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 2, Samuel said, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. Notice the speaking, the tongue of Samuel. That's the way he communicated his will to the children of Israel in Samuel's day. Peter responds in the New Testament, for prophecy never came by will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That tells me that these prophets who spoke in the first century, people to whom the apostles had laid their hands upon, who could speak prophetically from God or the apostles themselves, could provide for us a message that leads us. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, and really I'll tell you, verses 10 and following are really so valuable. So just concentrate for a moment on verse 12. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through the, those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven which things angels desire to look into. Notice that phrase again. Preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the prophets there. That's where we get the message from that Holy Spirit. And when Paul was writing, he says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery. 
Paul said, when I write this book or this letter to the Ephesians and you read it, you're reading what the Holy Spirit told me. Look at verse 4 or verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. That's the way God chose to reveal it. Now, you might ask then, well, if that means that's the way the Savior leads us, the way the Spirit leads us, I'd ask, well, how does Satan lead? Does Satan somehow come in, inhabit you and tell you, oh, yeah, go ahead and do this. Go ahead and do that. No, you know that's not the case. You know that the devil tries to lead you by doing exactly what Peter did with before the Lord, saying what the worldly thoughts were, the mind of the world was, and we somehow believe that. Which leads me to the third part of our lesson, and that's verses 12 through 17. So let's read these verses here and see if we can't appreciate what he's trying to say. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Now I want to notice at least a couple things out of this reading here. The first one is, Whose side you are on will determine where you will spend eternity. That means that if I choose to follow the Spirit, that Spirit's direction is going to lead me to spend eternity with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and all the others who have led that life as well. On the other hand, if I choose to follow the deeds of the world, the fleshly desires, and I'm going to spend eternity with all the rest of those who have chosen that, including the devil and his angels. It's really a matter of choice, folks. That's all it is. Flesh equals death. You remember Genesis 2.17? God told Adam and Eve, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And someone says, but they didn't die physically, but they died spiritually. They made the wrong choice. Their souls were not right in the sight of God. Now, why did they believe that, or why did she believe that? Because the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. She listened to the serpent Satan. And she believed what the devil said. And she did what the devil said to do. And in doing so, she was on the road to condemnation. But we go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, 15 through 17. And John would say, do not love the world or the things in the world. If any love, one loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Do you see that same sort of pursuit? To decide who's your, who are you really going to follow? But if you follow the Spirit, there is life. I go back to Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, the law of sin and death was the Old Testament law. It was a law of sin because it showed sin to be sin. It was a law of death because it condemned sin, and death was the condemnation of it. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. 
But he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. But then I go back, you've already used John 6, 63. Jesus said, the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and life. And there was before them that really choice. Whose side are you going to follow? And I don't know if you go on to read John 6, but if you read a little bit further, the disciple, it says many of the disciples walked with him no more. They left. He turned and said to his apostles, would you also go away? Remember what Peter responded? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One. You see, Peter said, we, we've got to make the right choice because we want life. That's what we're going to choose. But the second thing I want you to observe out of that passage there in Romans 8, verses 12 through 17, is verse 16 because that verse is so misunderstood by people in the world today and even by some members of the Lord's church. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see, a lot of people have misunderstood that preposition there, with versus to. Some people would read this verse, his spirit bears witness to our spirit. In other words, it's like God saying, okay, you're one of mine. I've had people tell me, how do you know that you're a Christian? I feel it right here in the heart. The Lord's told me I'm one of his children. As if the Lord spoke to you directly and personally. But notice that word with. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. You have what the God says through the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, the writings, and you have my spirit. What the Holy Spirit says is a person who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and who repents of their sins, confesses their faith in Christ, and is baptized for the remission of those sins will be added to the Lord's church. His sins will be forgiven him. That's what the Spirit says. And now I'm over here and I say, I believe that he is the son of God and I've repented of my sins. I've confessed my faith in him and I've been baptized. You know what that tells me? That I'm a child of God. Now, how do I know that? First John is a wonderful commentary on this idea. John is going to reiterate more than once the importance of this. Verse 3 of chapter 2 now, by this, we know we know him if we keep his commandments. We know that we know him if he's spoken to me personally. That's not what he says. If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. Folks, you can't get it any plainer than that. It's because of what we read in God's commandments, what the Spirit has said and what we're doing, and you put the two together and says, okay, now I know that I'm one of his children. But you go further, chapter 3 of 1 John. And by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than all than our heart and knows all things. You see, I know in my heart whether or not I've done what I'm supposed to do. And you know in your heart whether you've done what you're supposed to do. And what is it that tells you whether you're right or wrong? It's what God has said through his spirit. Chapter 5, verse 13 of 1 John. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. He said, these things I've written. Now, I can't, in fact, you ought to just take your red marker there and underline, these things I've written, these things I've written, these things I've written, that you may, you who believe may know that you have eternal life. You, someone says, can I know whether or not I'm saved? Absolutely you can. 
Well, how can I know that? I can look at what God's Word says and look at what I've done, and I can know whether or not I'm doing what is right. So we end the lesson by saying, do you have the Spirit? Are you led by the Spirit? Absolutely. If you're a son of God or a daughter of God. Paul's conclusion of Romans 8 was just absolutely magnificent. I mean, it's just a masterpiece of beautiful words, but it was not really just Paul's. It was what the Holy Spirit inspired him to say. I'm going to close our lesson with Romans 8, beginning with verse 31, and we're going to notice whether or not we are a conqueror. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, how shall he not also, or with him also, freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ, and furthermore, who is also risen, and even is at the right hand of God, and makes intercession for us. Now, pause for Jesus just a moment there. Who is it that could condemn us? It's Jesus. But what did he do? He died for us. Not only did he die for us, but he continues to make intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sakes we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors for him who loved us. And I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angel, nor principalities, nor powers, things present or things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I ask in the lesson with a question, are you ready to be a conqueror? I know this morning we have those in our audience who have not yet become Christians. Everything is ready for you. There's water in the baptistry behind me. There's garments ready for you to make a decision. If you want to become a Christian this morning, don't let anything stand in your way. Don't expect some sort of warm, fuzzy feeling to come over you that says, okay, now's the time. Here's what God expects you. He expects you with your mind to make a decision, to make a choice. And you can choose to be a conqueror. You can choose to be a winner. Have you made that choice and now gone back on it? Do you need the prayers of the brethren here at this congregation? I can assure you one thing. Just like Luke chapter 15 says, there's joy in the presence of the angels of heaven over one sinner who repents. We'll all rejoice, not that you've sinned, but that you've made a decision to make things right. We're going to pray with you. We're going to sing the song, There's a Fountain Free. If you need to respond, please come as together we stand and sing. There is a fountain filled with water.
just a moment. We're going to sing the first verse of what a friend we have in Jesus. Well, once again, we want to welcome each and every one of you. We're glad that you chose to be with us this morning and worship with us at the worship services of Bobby Branch Church of Christ. We know that you had a choice, and we're glad that you chose to be with us. Likewise, those who may be viewing us on Facebook Live, we're glad that you also chose to be with us. And we know that we have those, that our services are recorded and are available on YouTube, as well as being aired on Ben Loman Channel 6. Brother Tony, thank you for another great lesson. Thank you so much. And Stanley, for the song selections and uh, for the congregation for singing out. It sounds, some of our summer series speakers have commented, uh, several of them, about the singing here in the congregation. So uh, certainly a big part of our worship service and certainly appreciate that as well. Speaking of the summer series, tonight Brother Kyle Butt will be with us. This will be our final installment for this summer, for the summer series. And so I want to encourage you. We've, we've had several great uh, speakers, uh, all great topics, of course, but uh, certainly want to come out tonight and uh, support Brother Kyle Butt as well as hear him preach with us this evening. Also want to uh, uh, remind all the congregation as well, uh, we have Bible study following our services this morning. It begins at 10.15, which is about 10 minutes from now, and ends promptly at 11 o'clock. So I want to encourage each and every one of you to stay for Bible study this morning. So we'll have one more hymn and a closing prayer. What a friend we have. Father, we come to close this lesson, thanking thee for all the blessings that has blessed us with. Pray, Father, that you will continue to be with us through this day. Please forgive us of all sins that we have committed. Watch over us always and protect us. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.